All right, with the front axle all complete, today we're going to start work on the rear axle, which means we need to cut off all of the brackets that are on here because I bought a truss to go on this, and uh, that comes with all new brackets for the factory TJ suspension. And there we have it, brackets are all removed and we're ready to put the truss on. So, since I know somebody's going to ask, uh, since I didn't show it, how did I go from all these brackets to this? Uh, mostly I just used the angle grinder. First I used a cutoff wheel, just a regular cutoff wheel. Uh, on the angle grinder I cut all the pieces off as close as I could down to the uh, axle tubes. Then I moved on to this grinding disc to take down most of the meat that was left of the bracketry. And then to get everything nice and smooth close to the tube, I moved on to a flap disc. And uh, that pretty much took care of uh, getting rid of the mounts. And then uh, this whole thing was covered with some kind of undercoating. It was thick and pretty nasty, so I went ahead and used a wire wheel, just a cup brush like that. And uh, went over the whole thing. Got rid of all that coating, and uh, there's still a little bit of rust on here. And I'll probably run over this whole thing one more time with the wire wheel before I paint it up. But we're basically ready to put the truss on now. See, I got the basic structure on there. This is a truss with all the bracketry needed to swap a Ford uh, Explorer 8.8 like this into a Jeep TJ. Uh, I got the kit from Artec. They seem to be uh, one of the better ones on the market. I've never used them before, but everywhere I look seem to have good reviews. Now the next thing I did was tilt up the pinion on here to get to the angle that I would like to install this thing at. And that's based off of the pinion angle of the axle that's in the Jeep right now. So I already put some adjustable upper control arms in the Jeep and I tilted the pinion on the existing Dana 35 to get to the angle uh, that lined up well with the drive shaft and the transfer case. And it turned out to be about 15 degrees uh, in my particular case. So right now I have this tilted up at 15 degrees with that wood block right there. Super high tech, but I think it'll work. I'll just periodically check to make sure that this is at 15 degrees and then everything else we install will install level just like you'll see in a minute. This is the method that I usually use to find angles. We use a torpedo level and a speed square. And on the speed square, you can see we have all these angle markings here, and that's for pivoting off of this uh, point on the triangle. So I take the speed square. Stick it on the piece I'm working on, take the torpedo level, make it level, and then I read the number on the speed square, and in this case it has to be 15 degrees. I ended up ordering the Artec truss for this. Uh, we could have just gone with the brackets to swap the axle in, uh, but I went with the truss option instead, which is a little more expensive, but in the future it will give an option to four-link the rear, do a triangulated four-link if I want, and that's something I want the option to do, so I went with the truss. Uh, I honestly don't think we need it on a Ford 8.8 with the size tires I'm going to be running because these are pretty beefy axle tubes and this is a very strong axle uh, relatively uh, for a TJ to begin with anyway. But basically the Artec kit is kind of like a jigsaw puzzle. Everything comes uh, all cut out and nicely labeled. I mean everything's got a letter to go with it and it corresponds with a diagram on the instructions. Like we got an F, E, D and it should be pretty straightforward. However, I am running into an issue right off the bat here. You can see that this lower part of the truss is not sitting all the way flush on the axle tubes. And that's because these tubes are welded to the housing. And uh, this truss was not cut to accommodate that. And I wouldn't expect it to be. So we're just going to have to clearance these corners a little bit. Right on each side here. Try to keep this thing centered and drop it down onto the axle tubes. And here's what we've got. All the brackets are welded on. I've got every weld done. You can see some white sprays uh, here and there, and that's just some weld through primer. I sprayed anywhere I didn't think I'd be able to get with spray paint later on. 
So for example, I sprayed uh, underneath these little cups here on the coil spring buckets. I sprayed behind the uh, sway bar mounts right there and maybe one or two other places. And obviously I haven't gotten this under the Jeep yet, but so far everything fit up pretty well. Uh, the kit was very straightforward. And uh, if this thing fits, I definitely highly recommend this kit. Uh, the, the only thing we had to do to modify it was to trim a little bit of the truss around these welds where the tubes welded the housing. Other than that, everything fit together just like it should. Now I pretty much welded everywhere I possibly could on here, which is probably unnecessary. Now I probably could have gotten away with maybe only welding one side of this bracket under the truss and uh, maybe doing some stitch welds in here instead of a full uh, long bead, but I figure if we're going to make this thing strong, we might as well make it strong. Now I also plug welded anywhere that uh, two pieces fit together, so right here there would have been a little hole. That was a key way for this lower piece to fit into the upper piece. Uh, all those spots I plug welded and everything else was just a regular fillet weld. And now it's time for an unexpected re-gear on this axle. In the last video where I installed Dana 30 on this Jeep, I told you that both axles I picked up had 488 gears. As it turns out, the front had 488s and the rear had 456 gears. Why that was the case, I really don't know. But uh, unfortunately, we are now re-gearing this axle. Got the diff all pulled apart, everything's out of here, punched out all the races and bearings and everything. So that's totally stripped down and sitting on the bench over here. So this is the install kit I picked up to install the new gears. It includes all new bearings, seals, uh, ring gear bolts, and some other stuff. But right now I need to make a setup bearing for the pinion. It's going to be this bearing right here that's closest to the head of the pinion. Uh, I just need to hollow out the inside of the bearing so that we can slide it on and off while we figure out how many shims need to go between that bearing and the pinion. Then from there it'll just be a bunch of trial and error. I'm just using a little flap wheel kind of thing on the drill. And we go inside the bearing and widen it out. For anyone who doesn't know, a setup bearing is basically a loose fitting bearing that we use while we're setting up the gear mesh inside the diff. And uh, the reason we make a loose fitting bearing is because there are shims that need to go behind the bearing so by having a loose fitting bearing we're able to take the bearing on and off uh, nice and easily to adjust the shims until we get the right gear mesh and then once we get the right gear mesh we replace the setup bearing with an identical uh, unmodified bearing and that will get pressed on and there we go it sits all the way down at the base and uh, we're ready to put some shims in there and get this thing started. And just like that, we've got the new 48 gears installed. I chose not to film much of this because this is the first time I've set up gears and I don't want to lead anyone astray. So I think I've got them pretty good here. You can see the pattern on the teeth uh, looks pretty good right in the center. Uh, it's a little towards the root, but I think we're, uh, we're pretty good right there. We've got a good backlash. And uh, I think we're going to be pretty much set to go on this. Now one thing you'll notice over here on the copper line is I did end up putting a union in. Uh, I had to replace the copper line going into the seal housing on the ARB locker because it ended up breaking uh, with, over the course of taking this out and putting it back in right where it goes in. So I picked up some 8th inch copper line, uh, soldered it in using just plumbing solder. And then in an effort to not break it again, I just made it a nice short section so that as I pulled this in and out, I didn't have to worry about this big long section of copper tube uh, bending around and uh, put a union in here. So yes, it's one more place to leak, but uh, it made it a lot easier setting this up and it'll make it a lot easier taking this out any time in the future that I have to do that. So what do we have left on here? Uh, well, I ended up drilling a bre new breather hole right here because the breather hole that was in here before ended up getting covered by this piece of the truss. So I drilled and tapped a breather hole in the tube right there. Now pretty much all we have to do is uh, put the cover on this thing, paint it up, and then figure out the brake system. Got the axle all painted and reassembled. Now it's time to get it in. And just like that, we've got the axle bolted in and the brake line's plumbed up. 
a pretty simple bolt in and that's the beauty of using this uh, truss with bracketry so that all the control arms just fit right up. Uh, we threw some adjustable rear uppers on there just for a little fine tuning. Still using the stock lowers. Eventually I'll probably go to something else but I'm probably going to wait until I bend those before I go to aftermarkets because I'm probably going to get some nice aftermarket ones and we're just going to push off the purchase of that for as long as possible. So the thing I wanted to show you is how I set up the brakes here. Um, I did some searching online before I went ahead and did the brakes on this and I couldn't really find anything too good for a setup that anyone had done previously. So I'm going to show you what I did. Now we've got the uh, Ford Explorer calipers on here. Uh, this axle I think was off of a 97, so we've got the 97 calipers. The rubber brake hose right there is a right rear hose off of a 97 Explorer, and I'm running those on both sides. The left rear hose off of an Explorer, which this is the left rear side of the Jeep, uh, is a little bit longer, and uh, I think the uh, right rear hose is going to work a little better in this application. So we go from the rubber hose up to a hard line. Then the hard line runs up behind the track bar bracket right here, and obviously we don't have the track bar installed yet. As you can see, it connects into the factory TJ uh, T fitting for the rear brake lines. So I reused that, and it looks like there's going to be enough clearance uh, when the axle is at full compression. So that's not going to hit the floor. That was a concern that I had. If we didn't have that clearance, I would have just used a regular T fitting from the auto parts store and run a custom rubber hose from that up to the frame. So going from there to the other side, you can see we've got another hard line. I bought pre-flared lines, uh, which they only come in certain length segments, which is why that little uh, funny looking loop is in there, because I had to take up some slack. So that just runs over to the other side. And then comes over to the right side of the Jeep, where we've got another right rear 97 Explorer brake hose. And all the mounting points on here, so we've got the stud that holds the brake hose to the axle. That's a bolt that I just flipped around, welded the head of the bolt to the axle. And we've got a nut that goes on and holds on that part of the hose. And then I did the same thing for the other side and the same thing for the T-fitting in the center of the axle. So they're just upside down bolts with nuts on them. So I still need to figure out the e-brakes on here. Uh, doing a little bit of research, it sounds like some year Grand Cherokee uh, e-brake cables will fit on here and bolt right up to the TJ just fine. So I'll do a little more research on that. And I've got a measure for a drive shaft and you know, obviously get the springs in and... I uh, get the track bar in and, and tighten up the control arm bushings because we always wait for the suspension to be fully loaded with the weight of the vehicle before we tighten down the control arm bushings, uh, at least these rubber ones like we have in the factory control arms, just so they don't bind and uh, wear prematurely. So that's pretty much it as far as uh, getting the axle in. And then uh, obviously we've got the air locker in there, so we've got to get the air line done up. But uh, that's going to be another episode. So I'm going to get this all back together and then we'll show you what it looks like. All right, we had single digits this morning. Let's see if they can get this Jeep started and uh, shoot an outro for this video. Uh, this Jeep has been off the road for about a year and a half now. Uh, it's currently December 2020. Uh, the last time this was driven on the road was probably October 2019, uh, maybe even September, but uh, I didn't put it on the road this past year which means that this battery has not had a good charge uh, off the alternator in about a year and a half. So I start this up intermittently just to move it around the yard, but I don't usually leave it running long enough to charge a battery like I probably should, or I really should put some kind of tender on there, but I haven't. So let's see how this goes. And in case that wasn't painfully obvious, I'll show you. We still don't have a rear drive shaft in this thing. Now, I haven't gotten around to ordering one. And I guess it's partially laziness on my part and partially I don't want to have to order two drive shafts or have this one modified after I order it. Because obviously the build isn't really done yet and uh, I'm not sure... If I'm going to do anything else that would affect the length of the drive shaft. I really can't think of much uh, other than I'm contemplating swapping the AX5 transmission for an AX15 or an NV3550 out of a six cylinder TJ. 
And uh, I will be keeping the four-cylinder engine for sure. Uh, I actually really like these engines. Everyone thinks I'm crazy when I say that, but I'm a pretty big fan of these engines. But anyway, we've got the rear axle all installed. And obviously without the rear drive shaft, I haven't broken in the gears yet. So the only thing we have left as far as a swap is to get a rear drive shaft. I haven't gotten the e-brake hooked up yet, so I'll need to order e-brake components. And uh, we need to pull up the air locker. Other than that, we are good to go. And that's all the time we've got for today. Uh, as I just alluded to, there will be a part two where we get the rear drive shaft installed, hook up the e-brakes, and we get the air locker installed, and uh, wrap this whole thing up. So what did we spend today? We were over 1500 bucks, which was pretty close to double the price of putting that front axle in, and we're not done yet. And that really came down to needing to put the R-Tech truss on here, uh, which was a little under 400 bucks. And I think that was money well spent because this was a fantastic kit. Uh, the thing fit together very well. Um, everything went where it was supposed to go. I really don't think you could screw up installing this if you tried. Uh, if I ever need another truss, I'm definitely going to go with R-Tech again. Uh, I'm just, just very happy with this kit. Then we had the re-gear, which was an unexpected expense. And uh, luckily, it wasn't quite as expensive as it could have been since we did the re-gear in-house. This is my first re-gear. Um, I will say it's not a fun process, but it's also... I think people make it out to be a little more intimidating than it is. So if you've got patience, I would definitely say... You know, go for it if you want to. Um, I don't think it's, uh, I think it's definitely doable. So our build total is a little over $6,700 now. And that's going to keep climbing because we're obviously not done yet. Um, but as usual, thanks for watching. There's plenty more to come. Stay tuned.